name is Douglas Hughes. I was asked to make this testimonial video by Landis Fisher of uh, Straight Day Gate Ministries. He used to be my pastor when I lived in St. Louis, uh, which is where I lived when I got saved. Back in 1998, I got saved. Praise the Lord. Had a pretty wild life before that. I uh, was in and out of trouble ever since I was like uh, three, four years old, actually. My mom married a guy 20 years older than her when she was 18, and she left the small town to come to the big city. Uh, he was actually married to a Catholic woman. He performed a fake wedding ceremony. And I found out later all of our uh, last names are made up. Then uh, she left him probably when we were two or three. We were in a lot of trouble ever since then. My brothers and sisters and I were always fighting, practically killing each other, busting each other's heads open. I used to, uh, I set the house on fire even when I was like three, four years old. Um, I busted a, my brother and sister's heads open and uh, sixth graders had opened stuff on us in like first, second grade. Um, we lived in the inner city in Kansas City and my parents uh, decided it would be better to move us out to the country. Uh, we stood out more in the country and everybody knows you so that didn't help. So we moved to a suburb. We lived on the outskirts of the suburb of Kansas City, Lee Summit, and one block houses in the middle of a cornfield. We managed to get uh, kicked out of all the yards in the neighborhood. None of the kids were allowed to play with us. So. We were shoplifting from probably when we were like seven. I uh, started doing drugs when I was ten, smoking pot, huffing gasoline and lighter fluid, anything could do to get high. Our parents was, used to take us to uh, counseling, they had family counseling, and psychiatrists, both all on our own, each individual child, and we were on all kinds of psychiatric medication. It never seemed to help unless it made us like zombies, so we didn't get into too much trouble. I actually OD'd on the the psychiatric medication and got expelled from school when I was in eighth grade, yeah. Anyway, I was uh, stealing. We used to break into houses. We broke into the school. We'd just go in there and basically just for fun, spend all our time in there tearing up people's houses and digging through all their stuff. Same thing with the school. We spent a whole summer in the school one time. Hitchhiking from when I was about 10 or 11 also. All this time, people used to come and tell me about Jesus, uh, but I didn't believe in God. I believed in uh, evolution, like we're taught in school, so I would use that as an excuse to not even listen to him. But still, I had a yearning for God in my heart. Like Even when I was like four years old and they came and took us to vacation Bible school on a bus and I wanted to raise my hand in church, but I was scared because I was shy and I hated to get up in front of people, so I didn't want to have to go up in the front. And people would come and say to me, the Lord told me to come over here and uh, tell you about him. And uh, I thought they were retarded fanatics, but at the same time I was kind of jealous because uh, I didn't have anything that I could believe in enough to look like a retard over, I guess. So when my neighbors took me to church for a little while when I was probably around 10 or 11 also, I used to go to the Assembly of God in Belton with them. I probably said the sinner's prayer like a hundred times over the years, so people pick me up hitchhiking and different times I actually wanted to be different but I kept thinking I was going to say the prayer and lightning was going to strike me or something and then I'd be all right and uh, it never did I just went back to doing everything I'd always done uh, by the time I was 14 my parents had had enough I was only coming home when they were gone to uh, sleep and take a shower and and I'd leave again all the time and uh, so one day I watched them leave and I went took a shower laid down and they came back and they told me get dressed and we're going somewhere and they took me to uh, juvenile's attention at 26 and Cherry in uh, Kansas City and, uh, they were talking to the counselor for a long time I don't know if they were going to take me at first but then when my mom told them about how I knocked her down once because, uh, like I said, I was very violent and after my stepdad had left, he used to throw us, like, threw me all the way down the hall across the kitchen into the, the uh, stove once, I remember. Um, he used to make us stay up all night standing up or scrubbing the bathroom with toothbrushes until one of us confessed. So we'd always take turns confessing so we could just get the punishment over with finally. So I, after he left, I made a vow to myself that I was never going to let anybody hit me again. 
One day I was being belligerent and obnoxious to my mom. My parents actually padlocked their bedroom so that we couldn't uh, steal all their stuff. But I always figured out a way to get in anyway, so I had broken in and stolen their, their marijuana and was smoking it with my friends. And anyway, my mom came in the room. I don't think she caught me, but doing it, but I was being belligerent and she started shoving me and I knocked her down. So, uh, then, uh, the next Saturday, I think it was, my stepdad took me out behind the shed and, uh, told me why he was going to do what he's going to do and knock me down. And then, uh, anyway, this is a few months later. And, uh, when she was just down there talking to the counselor, the detention, she told them that story. And that's when she decided to uh, put me in the counselor lady. So I went into the detention. I went to a Nateland halfway house first, and I was going home and uh, going to school at my old school. But then I lasted a couple of months, and I uh, ran away. And uh, they put me back in detention. I went to McEwen School for boys, and I was in a pods the peer culture group there for a long time, but uh, and it was that time my uh, parents decided that they couldn't have me at home anymore. I was too much trouble. Uh, my sister had gone through the juvenile court already. She's three years older than me. She stole the family car and the checkbook and took off with some of the neighbor kids. And they got caught and she was in juvenile uh, system until she got pregnant. And had a baby and then they let her out and she got married to the my nephew's dad in the Jackson County Jail um, and he was going to the Jefferson City Prison and then she moved to Jefferson City so she could visit him anyway and then I went in um, and uh, my parents decided they didn't want me home anymore either and so I didn't get any visits for Christmas or uh, weekends or anything anymore, so I really didn't have any incentive to be good at all, so I just did whatever I wanted, kind of. They used to let us smoke, uh, so I started smoking when I was in the uh, McEwen School for Boys, actually. The caseworker had talked my mom into signing a permit so I could smoke so I wouldn't get in trouble for smoking without a permit. and. Uh, since I was sitting around in the music room all day with all the other boys smoking, I was pretty much smoking already, so I just didn't have a cigarette. So I started smoking. I ran away from there. They put me in, uh, well, they, since my parents didn't want me, they wanted me to take my GED and get, put me in a program where I'd get a job and pay rent and get out on my own eventually. So. I took the pretest, I aced that, but I wasn't old enough to take the the GD test yet. Uh, they put me in Waldron Transitional Living Center. I was supposed to go look for a job during the day, but I just wandered around uh, Midtown and Downtown Kansas City, and uh, mostly sometimes we hung out with the winos behind the liquor store at uh, 27th Terrace and Troost. And, uh, They'd panhandle money and get bottles of wine, and we'd pass it around and drink it until it was gone and start over again. I ran away from there, went back to detention. They sent me to the State uh, Division of Youth Services. I went to Boonville. While I was in Boonville, I went on a scare straight tour, and they took us to was the Jefferson City Penitentiary on this scared straight tour, and they uh, strapped me down in the chair in the gas chamber. Then I went to a uh, state group home number three. They were going to try to release me. My sister was moving back to uh, the Kansas City area with her. Uh, she's having another baby. And I was going to get released into her custody, but I ended up getting trouble again. I was in this uh, group home. Uh, the group leader used to do like astral projection and uh, stuff with this meditation. Anyway, I got mad at him one day. I threw the salt shaker at him. At the time, I'd taken my GD and I was going to college. And I was, uh, since I was, everybody else went to school, I made the menus and did the shopping and stuff. And uh, I think we were in the kitchen after dinner or something, like the way he was looking at me. So he took me to the police station, tried to press charges for assault, but they told him, since I'm in juvenile custody, they can't treat me as an adult because I'm a juvenile or else I couldn't 
be there to start with. So they took me to detention and then they took me to uh, group home number six and I stayed there just as like a guest in this other group home. I wasn't part of the, that was a positive paraculture group also, all of the state at the time. They got the paperwork together to release me because they said I was institutionalized, obviously, because I was acting out when they were trying to get me released to start with. So now they had to release me for my own good. So They got the paperwork together and I turned 17 and I got out and I went to live with my sister and I spent the next several years trying to make up for my missed uh, time when I was in the boys' homes. I missed uh, all of high school and I just basically partied and stuff. I met a girl. We had a son. She already had one child, and we had another child that one ended up not to be mine. And basically, all we did is party all the time. Uh, we worked for a friend of mine's dad for a while, trimming trees, and all of us, uh, the company bought the beer, and we all drank beer and smoked pot all day and trimmed trees and stuff. I was in and out of jail. Uh, jail for me was like uh, kind of like a family reunion because I knew all the people from uh, when I was a kid in detention and the boys' homes and stuff. Uh, I ended up doing a year in the county jail for a burglary. I did, and I started going to church while I was in there because the girls went to church too. Kind of like going to church. I thought it would be something good to do to stay out of trouble when I got out. Maybe I got out, went back to the same old stuff again. I even prayed. I asked God, I don't really know. I don't really know any other way, anything else to do. I mean, this is all I do. And I prayed and asked the Lord if I could have, you know, a wife and kids I would keep me busy and I wouldn't be in trouble and, and I would take them to church and stuff and anyway I got just what I asked for a wife with a couple kids already so I didn't have to start a family all over again we had three more kids and with my other son that made six uh, we were together for 12 years and I worked uh, 60 to 100 hours a week most of the time trying to support all the kids it kept me out of a lot of trouble and I stayed sober and clean for years at a time but every time I'd start Again, I'd be right back into it. Back in jail again. I actually did start going to church once and reading the Bible. I read from Genesis to Job. And I just got confused because I thought David was supposed to be a man after God's own heart. And the people of Israel, you know, had a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. And I just thought, Lord, why don't you show, show me that you're real? I would believe you. But eventually, I started drinking Again, as ended up, my wife was divorcing me, lost my job, all my friends. Uh, I didn't even want to live anymore. I was so torn up. It's hard to go from living in a family of eight to being all alone all of a sudden. And uh, then I was in trouble with the law, too, and I went to St. Louis County Jail. This time I didn't know anybody. I'd been transferred to St. Louis for my uh, job. I didn't know anybody there, so no more family reunion. I was totally miserable. I didn't want to live anymore, but I thought I owed it to my kids to support them still. And while I was there, I had this dream that I'd had before and I'd forgotten about. Probably six months before that, it stopped. For about a month, I'd had the same dream where I woke up. I was trying to go to sleep and there was these lights and a bunch of noise. And, uh, and I was irritated and I'd get up and I'd go look out the door and see what all the noise is. And there's all these people playing cards at these uh, checkerboards. And so, I was in jail trying to go to sleep and I was all irritated and there was all this noise and the light you can't turn it off stays on all day and night there's this light the window in the door with the brighter lights out there on and all there's like 50 guys outside the door in the bullpen all playing cards and stuff at these little tables with the checkerboards on them so when I went, I woke up, looked out the door, and I and I remembered the dream that I'd been having. I kept having it, and I would wake up, scared to death, sit up, bolt upright in my bed, and I felt like a ghost had just passed through my soul. And I couldn't figure out what was the deal was, because the dream wasn't really scary. But it kept happening over and over, and I thought, this, this is weird. And then I forgot about it after it stopped, and until I was living it out. And then I was in a daze, I was thinking, something showed me this six months ago when I didn't even know anything was going to happen. So I went to dinner and uh, sat down at an empty chair and this guy started trying to talk to me and asking me about myself. And he said, man, God is trying to get your attention. And then... That was like the Lord was speaking to me because I was in a daze trying to figure out what could show me 
the future before it happened. So while I was in jail, I started reading the Bible. Um, I felt like the Lord had given me time aside so I could read the Word. So I got a good news Bible and I could understand it real easily. And I just started reading it, reading it. I tried to spend all my time reading it and uh, going to church. They had church services every day in there. When I got out, I went to the, one of the churches that came into the jail. Uh, one of the groups, the guy was an assistant pastor, so that was the only one I knew where it was because I wasn't really from St. Louis. I lived there for several years, but I just went to home and to work, basically. So started going there, and uh, one day uh, Tim Barons showed up with a guy I knew from jail at my church and started telling me about Mission Gate. The guy said he brought him there to find me. Uh, I said they were having a meeting that night, so I went down to Mission Gate and I went to the meeting and I applied to get in. And they accepted me and I uh, started staying there. I was there for a, probably a little over a year during that time. While I was in Mission Gate, uh, the Lord gave me so much opportunities to serve Him. I ended up losing my job, actually, uh, because I was trying to witness at work. Well, actually, I, I wanted to witness at work when I got out of jail. I wasn't too sure if I was going to or if I should, but as soon as I got there, they'd already heard about my uh, conversion, so they started asking me questions. But I worked with a Mormon and a Catholic, and they used to like, try talking to me all the time about stuff, and I'd start talking to them about stuff, and I found out they were actually, they had recorders in their desks, so they would turn it on when I'd come and ask me something. They're actually trying to get me fired for proselytizing, so when I found that out, I kind of lost my temper and busted the door and left, and never went back, and so I was staying at Mission Gate, and I was just spending all my time uh, serving the Lord, basically, I was helping fix up all the houses there, went to all the meetings, uh, this guy, Dale, I used to go help him redo the plumbing. A lot of the houses are in terrible shape. We were doing Salisbury for a long time. I got to give my testimony on uh, Tim Burns' radio show, Tim and Al in the Morning, and Deborah Peppers and at several churches. And I got to serve at the Billy Graham Crusade. I gave my testimony on the, uh, I think it's the Hour Decision or something decision radio show. And I got to be a counselor and a security guard and stuff there. We used to like get donations. We'd go pick them up all the time. Actually, one night, got a call. They wanted us to bring the truck, and I had a van that somebody had donated the mission gate that they gave me. And so we went out in the middle of the night and uh, found out we were picking up pews. And that's when I met uh, Pastor Landis Fisher, like 11 or 12 at night in North St. Louis. And we're moving pews across town to the, the old uh, Salvation Army building where Mission Gate had their uh, office used to have their Sunday night meeting there, and another church used it during the day. The other church had left and took the pews with them. We're in the middle of the night uh, moving all these pews from some... Landis knew somebody that had pews in storage, so we're loading them all up, driving them across town, and, and uh, he was going to start a church. Mission Gate was going to start a church now, the uh, prison ministry. They had all these aftercare houses. actually started as uh, going to jails and preaching, and then they got tired of seeing everybody coming back over and over again, and they went to visit some people after they got out and they realized that they are got no place to go. They go back with their family or friends and they're all in the middle of a bunch of mess. They fall right back into it even though they're wanting to serve the Lord and love the Lord when they leave. So they wanted to make a safe place for them to go so they started getting these old kind of run down properties and letting them stay there all over uh, the north and I was on the south side of St. Louis, in Wisconsin. Anyway, so that's why the houses all needed fixed up all the time. And they just got this ranch property down in Cuba, Missouri. Fort Good Shepherd they were starting, and they wanted to start a church also. The prison many was, street was starting this church. Apparently Landis used to serve, volunteer there, and they asked him to be the pastor. He came from a church where the pastor had been discipling people, and he was the fourth one to leave from there and start another church. So I was uh, really stoked to hear about it, and I went down there for the ceremony where they all the other four pastors and his pastor came and laid hands on him. And that was like the grand opening, I guess. And then, of course, I went on Sunday night and started going on Wednesday night when he had a Bible study. And I was still going to my other church. We used to have the Christmas Angel Club on Friday night. So I was going down there and helping out on Friday night also. And, and then I would go with Tim out witnessing on the streets. With, he took a group out every Friday night. He lived right down the street on the, at the Salisbury house. So I'd just go down there afterwards and uh, go with him. Uh, Mike Hughes had wanted to start bringing the kids from the 
Friday night to church on Sunday and have a Sunday school. So they had a couple of vans they used to pick up the kids. And, but they had more kids than they had vans. So they asked me to help them one week and then they asked me the next week and then they wanted me to keep doing it. And I, I kept doing it and I wanted to get the kids to church. And I started praying because I wasn't sure if I should leave my other church. My other church just made me the like the worship leader, which we didn't have any musicians. Or, all we did is sing. There's a small church, like about six people and they had a tambourine and they banged sometimes and we'd all just sing. I think I was the only one there and when I brought my kids, we were the only ones there under 60 probably. So there's like six or eight people maybe besides us usually. So they asked me to start doing the worship. I was trying to hide in the back and sing real soft so nobody'd hear me. But sometimes I get carried away. So anyway, I prayed about it and I felt like the Lord was leading me to Landis's church. And I loved Landis's Bible teaching. He taught the word. I was just blown away how he would just like start teaching on something and then it's like the Holy Spirit got a hold of him and he started bringing verses from here and there, from Old Testament, New Testament. And I was like, wow. I started going to other churches where he was having Bible studies so I could hear more because one of the first things I noticed when I got saved was that the, a lot of the churches were really messed up and they got all kinds of weird occultic beliefs. and. Uh, I didn't realize most people never even read the Bible. That have gone to church all their lives and stuff. And uh, I, when I was reading it in jail, I just kept reading and reading and reading. I felt like I was just getting filled up with like clean water or something. It was incredible. Um, I got filled with the Holy Spirit once at a the uh, the church had come late, the Smitty at the jail, and they. His wife started singing, he told us, like, raise your hands and just start saying, thank you, Jesus, and t just tell him like you mean it. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Just keep telling him over and over. While we were doing that, he came around and anointed our heads, and when he anointed my head, I felt like something happened. But since they got there late, right then, the the, the uh, jailer came and told us we had to go back to the pod. So uh, he's trying to rush us all out of there, and we're all still with our hands in the air saying, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And so I started going out in the hall. I didn't really notice it. It's I think like the presence of the Lord was in the room or something. And when I went out of the room, so when I realized I was like, felt like I was glowing. It's like, it's the only way I can describe it. It's like my head was glowing. Like uh, the stained glass windows of people, the saints, they show them with the light coming out of their head or something. That's what I felt like. But, and it was incredible, uh, indescribable. Uh, I know it was like the Lord had touched me. It was just like a taste of what it's going to be like when we get to heaven and we're in His presence. Well, it's going to be way better for and it's going to be forever. Uh, so this wore off after a while. I went back to the pod and I just couldn't stop saying, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, over and over. But it's like it, the light thing dimmed down and went away probably within an hour or two. I got back there, went in my cell, and I started picked up my Bible and started reading where I had left off in Luke. I'd been skipping around. I decided I wanted to start reading right through a book. So first I read Ecclesiastes because I kept hearing that in my head, Ecclesiastes. And I looked, and sure enough, there was Ecclesiastes. So I read Ecclesiastes. I didn't really like it first because I was like, everything is vanity, like chasing the wind. So I went to Luke, and I was reading through Luke. and. When I came back, I was in Luke 4, and I picked up where I left off, and it said, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to preach good news, to set the captives free, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I was like, wow, that's what it is, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And that's why. So anyway, uh, I started going to Linus's church. I was like his right-hand man for a while, and we were there like every day of the week almost, cleaning or preparing stuff, practicing, Bible study, church. He used to go to the jail and to the the uh, homeless shelters and stuff. So I went to with, with him to the homeless shelter once too. And I moved away because uh, my sister and her family got saved also. And I moved back to uh, Kansas City to stay with them. Ended up getting married to a lady from Hawaii. And she went to Calvary Chapel. There wasn't a Calvary Chapel there. And she didn't want to go anywhere else because she grew up in church and she'd said so much weird stuff in the church. So, But we went to visit. Uh, I finally got to see my kids. I hadn't got to see them since all this stuff happened, really, even though I had joint custody of them. But I went back there and my wife uh, that I have now and I, and 
visited them, and then I got to start seeing them again. And and we took her to Landis's church, and she was just blown away too. She's like, he's like Chuck Smith. That's all. I never heard anybody teach the Bible like that except Chuck Smith. Um, that's the guy that the Lord started the Calvary Chapel movement through back in the '60s, the Jesus movement out in California. So. Um, then uh, we moved to Hawaii. I went back uh, a while back for my son's graduation. And I went to visit Landis' church and was just blown away about how he still goes in there, sets everything up, and he does, he plays so many instruments and he sings and he preaches, he does the whole thing. It's like a one man band preaching gospel hour. <laughs> Uh, it's incredible. Anyway, and then I went to Sunshine Mission with him again, too. Uh, and I was just blown away by that. And then he had, uh, right shortly before this, I'd been listening to his sermons on teachingbible.com and stuff, and I started writing him again. And he sent me this verse about the sons of Issachar knowing the times and what needed to be done. And I just kept thinking about that, and I was hearing all about, I was kind of a computer nerd, but I started hearing about YouTube and all this other stuff. I never really went on there. And my pastor started doing these prophecy updates every week, and I was editing the radio shows at the time, and this guy came, and I was a sound guy there for like uh, five years. This guy heard us on the radio, came, because my pastor now was born in Beirut, Lebanon, Arab, and he's a pro-Israel Christian teaching on Bible prophecy and how the Jews are back in the land and Jesus is coming any minute. So he's like, I got to... So he went to the local cable station, figured out what he had to do to get taping, got all the stuff himself, started taping it, started putting it on TV. He kept talking about putting it on the internet, YouTube or something. And then after Landis told me that, I kept thinking. And then one day I was taking the Way of the Master uh, training class and the guy told me to go on YouTube and look at this uh, videos they had about witnessing. So I went on there. I'd never been on there before. While I was on there, I'm looking around, and I found all these atheists, like, bad-mouthing the Lord and saying, you know, they'll debate anybody, all that stuff's been proven wrong. I come to find out that uh, evolution was a big lie, and they're brainwashing all of us, and the world was made in six days, just like it says in the Bible, because every word of God is true. And I studied creation science, and I, I knew the truth, and I just got, like, a righteous anger. I got to do something, so I don't know what to do, but I usually find a, I get a project, and I start working on it, then I can figure out pretty much whatever I need to do to do it. So I knew they were already filming the stuff at church, so I went there, and I said, you guys are going to put this on, the, I've been talking about it for a year or two now, putting it on the internet. Yeah, uh, you want to start doing it? Because I'll start doing it if you want to start doing it. So I started putting it on there. At first the church was they were a little leery and scared because it's uh, so controversial. And so I tried to do it separately. I set up different names Aloha Bible Prophecy and Aloha Bible Teaching and keep it separated from the church and uh, kept uploading it to all different sites. YouTube and GodTube and uh, to mogul and this other guy saw it on there and he wanted more and more and then he made us a podcast and i'm uploading it to the podcast and anyway it really kind of took off last time i looked they had like a half a million views on youtube anyway just praise the lord his word is true and he's coming soon so everybody needs to get ready i used to have on one of my pages i used to have one prophecy i know second timothy three because i first read that when i was in jail I thought, wow this is a prophecy of the last days it says in the last days perilous times will come and men will be lovers of themselves proud boastful arrogant and considerate disobedient they don't do what their parents say it's almost like the laundry list of the stuff in our heart that jesus gives in mark seven when i first read that when I was in the jail and I first got saved, I was like, that's me. Anyway, it is me. It's a prophecy of me, probably you too. I just want to make sure that you know before I go that Jesus died so you don't have to. He is God. He became a man, lived a life without sin so he could give his life in payment because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So if you believe by faith, I know I used to think, if you'll show me, I'll believe. But that's not the way it works. It's by faith. If you believe, he'll show you. I know. I used to believe everything opposite of what I believe now. Nobody convinced me to change my mind. I started believing in God, and God showed me the truth. I thought about stuff more <clears throat> clearly and rationally than I ever thought before in my life. All the stuff I thought was a bunch of fanatics. It's real. Every word of God is true. Let God be true and every man a liar, because he is real. He created the earth in six days by his word. The whole universe obeys his command. The word universe, it means a spoken sentence. 
his sentence. Jesus is the word. He used the word. He spoke the word. Jesus created the earth. He became a man because he loves us so much. He gave his life in our place. And his shed blood cleanses us of all of our sins. We're forgiven. Even all the stuff that I've done in my whole life. Terrorizing my brothers and sisters and everybody around me at times. I was really a nice guy most of the time when I wasn't terrorizing everybody and getting thrown in jail and assaulting police officers, but that's what we all think. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the end thereof is death. And the other verse like similar to that says, every way a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord tests the heart. He's the judge, and he's going to judge the living and the dead one day very soon. So... You need to surrender your life to Him before it's too late. Lord, I just want to pray before I go that you would open hearts, minds, and eyes, Lord, that whoever you would have to see this video would see it, Lord. And that you would touch their heart, your Holy Spirit would open their blind eyes, Lord, because I know they were born dead, Lord. I was born dead, but now I'm alive. I'm alive in you, Lord. I just pray for salvation for the lost all over this earth, Lord, that you would break down the strongholds, principalities, and powers, and the against the rulers of darkness and cast off every weight and hindrance that would hinder anybody whether it's drugs, alcohol, sex, false religion, cults, new age, devil worship. I've met devil worshipers here as a Christian too even. Lord, I just come pray that you would send your holy angels and your Holy Spirit come against them, convict of sin and of righteousness and of judgment and set the captives free, Lord. Let the blind see. Heal the lame and the sick. Lord, I'm proclaiming this is the acceptable day of the Lord. And the time is short. I know you're coming back any second, Lord. I love you. I can't wait to see you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name.